A very wise person once said, some people leave happiness wherever they go, while other people leave happiness whenever they go. Which is it for us? Happiness wherever we go or only whenever we go? That is, are we having a positive impact on the lives we come in contact with every day? Are we making this world a better, happier, more joyful place, or more often sad to say something quite the opposite? This is what I'd like to talk about this morning. Lives that leave happiness wherever they go. Today in our continuing study of Jesus' parables, we find our Savior offering us a seemingly a very minimalist little teaching that utilizes a very uh, common substance for its imagery. He offers us the parable of the salt. Now, throughout human history, salt has been one of the most important and valuable spices worldwide. And why? Well, because it just has so many vital uses. For instance, salt is a preservative. Uh, Before the days of refrigeration, salting was the only method available to keep meats from rotting. Uh, Salt is also integral in the production of, of leather goods from animal hides and skins. Salt is also understood to have medicinal properties. Uh, In the book of Ezekiel, it's described how in ancient times a newborn baby's skin was rubbed with salt to protect it against infection. But of course, most of all, salt is a seasoning agent, arguably the world's foremost seasoning agent. It just plain makes things taste good. And this is the primary use that Jesus picks up on in the parable where he centers his discussion around the taste that salt provides. Now, working off this image of this substance, whose primary purpose is to make things taste good, Jesus makes the following bold statement to to the huge crowd that has come to hear him speak. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Notice his point. It's the premise of his whole discussion. You, that is, whoever you are, young, old, male, female, rich, poor, faithful, faithless, whatever, you are what decides the very flavor of this world. You are what determines whether this life that we all know here together tastes good or tastes lousy. It's a statement of profound, inherent human purpose and calling to which Jesus then adds this warning. But if salt has lost its taste, can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. Basically, he's saying, you know, but folks, if you lose this, If you forget about this calling or you never know it to begin with, if you fail to make your life about offering this this rich flavor to the world around you, bettering lives, bettering this earth, then you become good for nothing. Your whole reason for being just becomes thrown away. And with it, your life becomes lost and wasted, tossed aside and unthinkingly, uncaringly trodden underfoot. His message, that each and every one of us, no matter who we are, is not here just to kill time, not just to take up space, not just to exist, but to improve the flavor of this world, to offer our input, to to change lives, to make a difference. And in return, the lives we then personally experience, whether our lives are, are thrown away or valued, is wrapped up in whether or not we pursue this truth. So how do we pursue it? How do we go about becoming this this fundamental salt of the earth we were created to be, and thus make this world taste better and with it our own lives? Four thoughts. Four suggestions. Suggestion number one, be salty. To begin with, as just stated, the whole premise of Jesus' discussion here is that each and every one of us has been created for this purpose, to make a difference in the world. And in making a point of offering this fundamental statement to us of who we are, that we're the salt of the earth, he is, of course, also right off the top, letting us in on what so often is, is missing in our lives, the fundamental problem that occurs, namely, that we lose sight of this. That we forget that this is who we are, that this is, this is our purpose. Let's face it, on any average day, while we undoubtedly try to be good people and to, to think about being kind and helping those around us, overall, truth be told, most of our time and energy is devoted to a lot of other things. Our lives get wrapped up in a lot of other stuff, much of it very important, but, but we lose sight of this primary task of improving our world. And Jesus' first point being that with this goes so much of the life that God wants us to have. Just think about the things that consume your attention on any average day. If you're like most people, it's things like, you know, going to work, making money, uh, paying the bills, uh, going to the doctor, cooking meals, doing chores, taking your medicine, planning for retirement, getting the car repaired, running to the store, caring for your family. Yeah. Life is mostly responsibilities, problems, tasks, and worries. Now, all this is normal. 
And much of it is entirely necessary. It's just that in the midst of all this, focusing ourselves on changing the world for the better frequently gets put on the back burner or on no burner at all, right? It becomes something we all will do when we get around to it, when we have some time. Not the main thing we're supposed to be about always, and that's the problem. The first lesson here is to remember that this is why we are here, to improve life's flavor. Yes, do everything else you need to do, but keep this higher calling foremost, and life's richest abundance will be yours rather than so often lost to you. Simply put, too often we allow ourselves to forget that we are ultimately the salt of the earth, here to transform the world, and with this goes our very lives. In his book, Led by the Carpenter, author D. James Kennedy offers the following reflection. He writes, A man walked into a little mom-and-pop grocery store one day and asked, Do you sell salt? Do we sell salt, said the pop, the proprietor. Just look. And pop showed the customer one entire wall of shelves stocked with nothing but salt. Morton salt, iodized salt, kosher salt, sea salt, rock salt, garlic salt, seasoning salt, Epsom salts, every kind of salt imaginable. Wow, said the customer. You think that's something, said pop with a wave of his hand. That's nothing. Come look. And Pop led the customer to a back room filled with shelves and bins and cartons and barrels and boxes of salt. Unbelievable, said the customer. You think that's something? Said Pop, come, I'll show you salt. And Pop led the the customer down some steps into this huge basement, five times as large as the previous room, filled every wall, floor to ceiling, with every imaginable form and size and shape of salt. Even you huge 10-pound salt licks for use in cow pastures, right? Incredible, said the customer. You really do sell salt. No, said Pop, that's just the problem. (laughs) We never sell salt, but that salt salesman, oh boy, does he sell salt. (laughs) Concludes Kennedy, this is just so often the whole problem. Too much of the salt of the earth is left sitting on the shelf where it does no good. Too many Christians nowadays are on a low-sodium diet. It's low-sodium Christianity. Too much of the salt of the earth is being left sitting on the shelf. Is this us? Suggestion number one in living a life that makes this world taste better and with it our very lives. Be salty. Remember that this is job one. Then suggestion number two, be invisible. Thinking about how salt does what it does. Uh, how does, How does salt work best? That is, when you season something with salt, how do you know when you've used just the right amount? Well, it's when you don't really taste the salt, right? Salt basically works, as it has been said, by making food foodier, right? It disappears, in other words. As one scholar writes, the number one job of salt is to make something taste good. For instance, I don't know about you, but I can't stand corn on the cob without salt on it. Now, when I've eaten a piece of corn on the cob that I really like, I put it down, and what do I say? Do I say, that was some really great salt? No, I say, that was great corn on the cob. Why? Because the job of the salt is not to make you think about how great the salt is, but how great the thing is with which it's involved. Salt works its magic quietly, invisibly. That's what makes it so wonderful. It makes everything else wonderful. This is the second message here. That like salt, we are each called to make the world taste better. But the real trick in doing this is like salt to do this quietly, invisibly, silently, disappearing into life, but enhancing its flavor always. To offer that kindness, a a little gift, uh, maybe a a good word, just a moment of listening in which blessing appears and we just disappear. At the very best, we are not even barely recognized, but rather only the other person and the gift to their lives. Remember how Jesus once said, when you give to those in need, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. It's that invisible giving where we seek no personal reward, but only that another person gets blessed. An anonymous poet offered these words. He wrote, If I can throw a single ray of light across the darkened pathway of another, if I I can aid some soul to clear sight of life and duty, if I can wipe from any human cheek a tear... I shall not have lived my life in vain while here. If I can guide some erring one to truth, if I can scatter light and hope and cheer and help remove the curse of mental darkness, if I can make more joy, more hope, if I can teach one man that God and heaven are near, I shall not have lived in vain while here. If by life's roadside I can plant a tree, 
beneath whose shade some wearied head may rest, though I may never share its beauty, I shall yet be most blessed. Though no one knows my name nor drops a flower upon my grave, I shall not have lived in vain while here. It's the invisible giving. It's the very best blessing. It's salt of the earth living. How might each of us do this this week? Consider the following reflection entitled, One Book at a Time, by Christian author and librarian Gina Lee. She writes, One of the ways I make a difference in people's lives is by encouraging them to read. It is especially cool to help out the kids in the children's room at at, at the library. A lot of times they have an assignment like read a biography, and they're not even sure what a biography is. I ask them about their hobbies and their favorite subjects, and I try to help them pick out a book that they will actually enjoy reading. Sometimes I feel frustrated when other people do what seems like really important things for God. I dream of going on a mission project or something far across the world, but I just don't have the time or the resources. When I feel my contribution is small, I have a friend who takes me aside. Did you ever think that maybe God is using you right where you are, she asks. Did you ever think how much it means to these kids to have you take the time to find a book that they want? The lives changed by doing something almost no one sees. Did you ever think that you're just right where you're supposed to be? And that's when I know that I'm doing, what I'm doing is making a difference. I remember my mom and some of my teachers helping me pick out books when I was little. They instilled in me a love of knowledge and of good books, and now it's my turn to pass it on. What I'm doing today can make a difference tomorrow, one book at a time. It's disappearing into the blessing of other lives. Suggestion number two in Salt of the Earth Living, be invisible. Which leads us then into suggestion number three, be miraculous. You know, thinking about what, what Saul can do, its importance in human life, you know, in so many ways, as, as, as mentioned earlier, it's important to know that salt is simply an amazing substance. It is relatively common and plentiful, yet it has the ability to change so many things for the better. It heals, it preserves, it purifies, it has the power to take bland and to make it better, to take bad and to make it good. To the ancients, it was a wonder, it was a miracle, a miracle of life. Now, in our modern world, we've lost much of this sense of amazement over this seemingly very ordinary substance. But from a modern scientific perspective, consider the following. A noted scholar writes, Did you know that salt is a miracle? It is composed of two poisons, chloride and sodium. If you ingest either by itself, you will die. But put them together and you have common, ordinary salt. And that which used to bring death somehow comes together to bring life, better life, and that's a miracle. So it is with the Christian life, poisoned by sin, with death looming in the shadows, but is confronted by the grace of God in his death, and those two negatives merge to form a positive redemption. Now, obviously, such a, an interpretation was not available to the original pre-scientific audience, but, but I offer it merely to perhaps provide a way to get our modern minds to grasp the sheer wonder of this that, that is the heart of Jesus' teaching here, that salt is a miracle. It's a miracle of life. That is, salt is ultimately a symbol of the miracle-working, life-creating, life-transforming power of God available in Jesus Christ that can take anything and make it good, you know? That can even take death and make it into life. It points us to remember the miracles God has worked in each and every one of our lives and to live those miracles. That is, Jesus' next message in this parable, in directing us to see ourselves as the salt of the earth, is basically him saying to this, this is what you are, folks. In me, you are a walking miracle. A miracle of life. Offer that miracle to somebody. What miracle has God ever worked in your life? Forgiveness, when you felt totally filled with shame? Love, when you felt completely undeserving? Companionship, when seemingly all alone? Strength, when at the end of your rope? Hope, when all seemed dark? Healing, when broken? New life, when down and out? A relationship restored that seemed done and over? What miracle has God in Jesus Christ worked in your life, and how can you offer that to somebody else today? A famous pastor once told the following true story. In his parish, there happened to be this certain woman, and she was a longtime member of the church, and she was very faithful in her participation, a woman who truly loved the Lord and was keenly aware of her salvation in Jesus Christ. A great woman, yet she lacked one thing, and it drove her crazy. She hadn't yet discovered what her calling in life was. This woman had read all the stories in the Bible of the the great people and their callings, and she was 
firmly convinced, and rightly so, that, that everyone in Christ, clergy and lady alike, have a calling to ministry, a unique vital place within the working of God. Yet she had yet to discover her own, and it was driving her nuts. It tormented her year after year. She didn't feel like a complete Christian until one day. The pastor was in his office when this woman suddenly burst in. Pastor! Pastor, she exclaimed, after all these decades, all these years, I finally know what my calling is. Fantastic, he replied. Quick, quick, tell me what it is. And she answered, I have cancer. The pastor was thrown for a loop. At first, he didn't know how to respond. He finally, he finally said, I, I, I'm afraid you lost me. How on earth is cancer a calling? How on earth is, is this in any way a good thing? To which she replied, don't you see? The cancer isn't the calling. It's not a good thing. God didn't give it to me, and God doesn't want me to have it. But as I go through it with God, I'll learn like no book can teach me how you go through it. So then I can help others to make it through as well. And that's exactly what she did. Over the final three years of her life, she established a support group at her church for cancer victims and their families, a group that still operates today. And most especially in the amazing strength and even joy that God worked amidst her illness, she helped countless others to find their way with God through the disease. Suggestion number three in salt of the earth living, be miraculous. Offer your miracle in Jesus Christ. All of which leads us to finally suggestion number four, be valuable. In the end, of course, in modern usage, salt is a very common, relatively inexpensive a generally overlooked item. We, we just sort of take it for granted. In fact, in certain ways, it's almost, it's almost even scorned nowadays, you know, our modern low-sodium diets, right? However, in the end, it's important to note that in Jesus' time, this was not the case. It's quite the opposite. In ancient times, salt was an extremely precious substance. Throughout history, salt has always been one of the most valuable commodities, mined, farmed, traded between nations, used as a system of currency. In fact, our modern English word, salary, The payment for work comes from the Latin meaning payment in salt, referred to how Roman soldiers were paid. Salt wasn't as a precious commodity. It's a valuable commodity. So, in effect, this is the final thing that Jesus is saying to his audience then and now. You are valuable. You can well imagine how shocking this must have been to his original hearers. Most of them just ordinary people, you know, simple fishermen and farmers in a time that considered them to be nothing. But you see, this is primarily what Jesus wanted them and us to know about ourselves, to understand ourselves as, as pricelessly valuable. It's a reminder to see ourselves this way and to accept nothing else. The final lesson, to know that as the salt of the earth, whoever you are, you have something valuable to offer, something desperately needed by the world, needed by someone else. Make it your life's mission to offer that gift. In his book, When the Game is Over, It All Goes Back in the Box, Author John Orberg offers the following reflection on exactly this truth. He writes, If you ever wonder if you can do anything great, what's your purpose, your special place in the world, if you have any real worth, let me tell you my favorite story of one person's search for a mission, the story of Johnny the Bagger. Johnny works at a grocery store. One day he went to a training event led by a speaker named Barbara Glanz. She was talking to 3,000 frontline workers for a supermarket chain, truck drivers, cashiers, and stockers. Barbara was speaking on how people can make a difference. She described how every interaction with another person is a chance to create a memory to bless someone's life. She talked about how important it is to look for those moments. She placed on the walls, as she always does when she speaks, posters with inspiring sayings. She told some stories and then went home, but she left her phone number behind. She invited the people at the conference to give her a call if they wanted to talk more about something that she had said. About a month later... Barbara received a call from one of the people at that session, a 19-year-old bagger named Johnny. Johnny proudly informed her that he had Down syndrome, and then he told his story. Barbara, I like what you talk about, but I didn't think I could do anything special for our customers. After all, I'm just a bagger, he said. But then Johnny had an idea. He decided that every night when he came home from work, he would find a thought for the day for his next shift. It would be something positive, some reminder of how good it was to be alive or how much people matter or how many gifts we're surrounded by. And if he couldn't find something like this, he would make one up. Every night, his dad would help him enter the saying six times on a page of, uh, on the computer. Then Johnny would print 50 pages. 
He would then take out a pair of scissors and carefully cut 300 copies and sign each one. Johnny put the stack of pages next to him while he worked. Each time he finished bagging someone's groceries, he would put his saying on the top of the last bag. Then he would stop what he was doing, look the person straight in the eye and say, I've put a great saying in your bag. I hope it helps you to have a good day. Thanks for coming here. A month later, the store manager called Barbara. Barbara, you won't believe what's happening here. I was making my rounds. When I got up to the cashiers, the line at Johnny's checkout was three times longer than anyone else's. It went all the way down to the frozen food aisle. The manager got on the loudspeaker to get more checkout lines open, but he couldn't get any of the customers to move. They said, that's okay, we'll wait. We want to be in Johnny's line. One woman came up to to the manager and grabbed his hand, saying, I used to shop in your store only once a week. Now I come here every time I go by. I just want to get Johnny's thought for the day. There is a reason Johnny's lines are three times longer than anyone else's. Our souls need to be fed, just as our bodies do. Johnny is doing more than filling bags with groceries. He's filling lives with hope. Of course, what makes the words on the paper mean so much is who they come from. Words alone can can come from a fortune cookie. When people get them from Johnny, they are reminded of the beauty of one person forgetting his own limitations and seeking to make his life a blessing to someone else. Whatever burdens Johnny carries makes his gift that much brighter. But it doesn't end there. A few months later, the manager called Barbara once again to tell her Johnny was transforming the whole store. He told her, that when the floral department had a broken flower or or unused corsage, they used to throw it away. Now they go out into the aisles, find an elderly woman or a little girl, and they pin it on her. The butchers started putting actual ribbons on the cuts of meat they wrap up for their customers. The people who make their shopping carts are even trying to make their carts with wheels that actually work, right? (laughs) And all the people at the grocery store are being blessed through Johnny. And the point is, you can be Johnny the Bagger. What Johnny does isn't slick, complicated, or calculated. He is just a bagger expressing his heart. You can help make that happen wherever you are. Somebody once said, the problem with life is that it doesn't come with an operator's manual. To which a person of faith replied, wrong. God has hidden everything we need to know all around us in all the simplest, most common places if we will only look. Profound truths revealed in ordinary, everyday things. This week, whenever you sit down to eat, at home or at a restaurant, alone or with company, whenever you feel your food needs a little flavor and you reach for the salt shaker, or when someone asks you to please pass the salt, stop and remember who you are, the salt of the earth. And as you or another take a moment to improve the flavor of the food, ask, did I do the same for the world today? This week, make this world a better place. Leave happiness wherever you go. Make this life taste better. Be salty, be invisible, be miraculous, be valuable. Let us join together in singing our closing hymn, number 593 in the Red Hymnal, Here I Am, Lord. Would you please stand?